Hello and welcome to the beautiful University at Buffalo SUNY where the winter weather is absolutely wonderful. My name is James Lemoyne and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Organization and Human Resources. Today I'm very excited to share with you a brief summary of my research on servant leadership, which was my dissertation topic at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Now if you've read any business magazines in the past few years, you've probably heard the term servant leadership several times. Uh, the Washington Post calls it a path to high performance. Inc. Magazine says that it will lead you to success. Howard Schultz says that our next president needs to be a servant leader, and the Harvard Business School wonders, if it's so great, why aren't there more of them out there? I've been fascinated by this idea of a leader who acts first and foremost to serve others, but I noticed that whereas everybody seems to agree that servant leadership seems like a smashing idea, nobody's quite sure exactly what it is. I mean, sure, there are operational research definitions and survey instruments, but what exactly does it mean to be a servant leader? Can we describe it in, in simple terms, and, and I mean really simple, so that everyone could understand it, so that our grandmothers could understand it? And after we've defined it, what's it good for? For? How does it work? When or for whom does it work? Dave Wetton of the Academy of Management Review has called questions like these the building blocks of theory. And it seems like if we really want to promote positive forms of managerial leadership in modern organizations, answers to questions like these would be very helpful. To answer these questions, as the Mad Hatter once said, it's useful to start at the beginning. And the beginning for servant leadership is with a brilliant consultant and philosopher named Robert Greenleaf, who in 1970 wrote his groundbreaking essay, The Servant as Leader, introducing the world to the formal concept. He defined servant leadership in that essay say as those being served becoming healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants, which sounds like a wonderful ideal for us to shoot for, and it's certainly an appealing idea, but well, it doesn't really tell you exactly what it is, does it? Those are the outcomes of servant leadership, yes, but what are the actual things servant leaders do that get us to those outcomes? That's what we need to know to have a proper definition of servant leadership, don't we? Luckily, Bob Lydon, Sandy Wayne, and their colleagues have given this a lot of thought and provided us with an operational structure, suggesting that servant leadership is composed of seven positive behaviors. I attempted to combine their research with about a hundred books, book chapters, magazine pieces, and scholarly articles on servant leadership, as well as pretty much everything Robert Greenleaf ever published, in order to come up with what I hope is a comprehensive but understandable definition. Servant leadership is influence behaviors, manifested humbly and ethically within relationships, oriented towards follower development, empowerment, and continuous and meaningful improvement for all stakeholders. With this understanding in hand, I set out to test a contingency theory of servant leadership in which it impacts outcomes of interest to organizations through making the followers of servant leaders, well, as Greenleaf said, healthier, wiser, freer. I operationalize these outcomes as pro-social motivation, meaning that they become more motivated to help and work with others, and psychological capital, which represents an individual's self-efficacy, hope, resilience, and optimism. Both of these characteristics, pro-social motivation and psychological capital, should in turn lead those team members to perform at higher levels. I was also particularly interested in another outcome, suggested by Greenleaf himself and many theorists since, but never empirically tested. The idea that the followers of servant leaders are more likely to become servant leaders themselves. I believe that servant leadership also has ramifications for the challenges we continue to face with gender biases in leadership. There's this idea called the think leader think male paradigm, in which people tend to think of leaders as more masculine than feminine, just because stereotypical leader characteristics like risk-taking, aggressiveness, and independence happen to align fairly well with masculine stereotypes. This often leads us to automatically think of men as leaders, but not so much women. Yes, Google has evidence of this think leader, think male stereotype. Just do a search for great leader and count how many times a woman shows up in the first 100 results of an image search. Count? Yeah, that's pretty sad. Google suggests a separate search called female great leaders, but honestly, do we really need to do that in the 21st century to see some women show up? Anyway, as servant leadership is more about helping others, cooperating, developing them, and caring for the broader community, it becomes apparent that it actually doesn't mesh well with stereotypes about men at all, but rather it's a pretty good match for stereotypes about women. So I hypothesize that opposite to what we found in just about every other study of other approaches to leadership, women, rather than men, would have the advantage that they'd be more successful at servant leadership. We tested this moderated mediation model with a new multi-level modeling approach based on the work of preacher and colleagues that allowed for modeling results at both the individual and group levels. We tested it in four different organizations, including small and large organizations, for-profits and not-for-profits, in order to maximize the study's generalizability. And I'm delighted to say the model worked. There were positive effects of servant leadership, including the creation of new servant leadership, just as has been theorized. Those effects did go through pro-social motivation and psychological capital, and the effects were significantly stronger for women, although servant leadership still worked pretty well for men, too. It's my hope that these results can contribute to solving the great leadership puzzle, building strong theory for the effectiveness of servant leadership, and providing practical evidence for just how useful it is in modern organizations and businesses, both for performance and for creating new proactive leaders from followers. It may also represent a particularly useful style for women leaders and invert all stereotypes, giving them a real leadership advantage. Pretty neat? I think so, and I hope you do too. 
Whew, is that it? Are we out of time? Because seriously, my, my throat's really dry here. Do, do we have any of those yoo-hoos left?